and you're live. Welcome to a Growing Concern. We're going to talk about my favorite forest advocacy organization tonight, BARC, which I'm a member. And I have with me Lori Ann Bird, who is the Restore Mount Hood Campaign Manager. Did I get yep. that right? All right. All these titles sometimes get by me. But we're going to talk about BARC. We're going to talk about what BARC does, and we're going to move into a, two of their main two of their campaigns. The campaign to stop Nestle from acquiring uh, Mount Hood National Forest water and also a, a more recent proposal to create a, a downhill bike, mountain bike path, path system up on, the, up on the hill. I don't have the right words yet. Maybe I'll get that right before the end of the show here. And uh, Lori, Lori is working on both those issues. And uh, this thing with Nestle has been going on for some time now. It sure has. Yeah, Nestle has been looking at the water in Cascade Locks for a couple years now. Um, one thing we have to celebrate is that they thought they were going to be breaking ground on their plant right now and they don't even have an application with the Oregon Water Resource Department approved. So we're definitely... Um, and that's doing, their first main step. And then. that's the very first step. So we're definitely doing a good job at keeping them at bay. All right. Well, you know, that's sometimes uh, things taking a long time work against you and quite often they work for us. That's right. I know that all those, all those pods and, and uh, uh, sit-ins and things that were going on up and around uh, Eagle Creek stretched things out long enough that the folks were able to get a lot of the, a lot of the, the uh, legislators and mayors on board and eventually shut it down. And it, it looks like these, this delaying tactics is, 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 is hopefully going to work in this. Although it specifically isn't delaying tactic, it's, it's just the steps you have to take in order to, to stop what they're doing, I would imagine. That's and, right. And, and the first step they're doing is, uh, is uh, trying to, is it the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife? Which department is that, that that they have to get the water from? Well, so the water is coming from a spring, um, and it's on state lands. The the state lands um, where the spring comes from, comes out of the earth, is about 18 feet outside the boundary of Mount Hood National Forest. So if it was within Mount Hood National Forest, we would have to uh, we'd have to do a much more extensive environmental review of the process um, and the environmental impacts that this would cause. But because it's on state land, we don't have the National Environmental Policy Act um, that they have to comply with, and so we're just looking at state issues. However, to get their hands on the water, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife needs to give up their right to the water. So what they want to do is transfer that water right to the city of Cascade Locks, and then Nestle would purchase the water as a municipal water user at five cents a gallon. I see, and of course, Cascade Locks needing jobs like most or most areas are gonna are probably for it. Many people are. You know, one thing is that a lot of people in Cascade Locks are really battle wary from um, the casino issue. Oh right. And so there's so <laughs> much division amongst neighbors that I think a lot of people just aren't wanting to stick their necks out. And the truth is, Nestle has promised them 50 jobs in, um, in Cascade Locks. The problem is that a lot of those jobs require very specialized skills that don't currently exist within the community. So there's a really good chance that they're going to bring people in from outside. And so there's a very small chance that you know, mm -hmm. anywhere near that number of jobs would come from Cascade Locks. And also, Nestle has a long record of over-promising and under-delivering on jobs. And so what we're doing is trying to work with the community to help them see um, some of those issues right now. Mm -hmm. So this first step has been um, kind of sus in suspension for some time then. That's right. So the water that they want to use is currently used to raise endangered salmon at the Herman Creek Fish Hatchery. Right. Um, and that's, it's very, very nice cold water. It's very high quality water and they want to bottle it, of course, because they can then sell it as really nice um, spring water. So they had to do a number of studies to, to see what kind, you know, whether they could replace that water with other water for the fish that um, were raising at the hatchery. Once they got past that process, they finally submitted their applications. But there's the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife still needs to complete some of their paperwork um, to the Oregon Water Resource Department. And so while they've submitted three different applications that would facilitate the transfer and eventually allow Nestle to get their hands on the water, none of that is actually um, totally live yet. They're still sitting on the applications. Mm -hmm. Well, I know Julia DeGraw with uh, an organiza national organization that's fighting and gave a, gave a, a press conference well over a year ago at the ODF. Mm -hmm. And uh, nothing, nothing's happened with any of this. 
That's right. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that. And there's a lot of issues involved in this. Is the issue of the fact that it's the uh, petroleum products that go into the plastics that make it, all the, the all the uh, shipments. I uh, forget what Julia says. There's going to be how many trucks a day going through? I think it would be 150 truck trips a day. And that's, that's an incredible amount the of city trucks. Of I, I'm not positive about that number. It was a I lot apologize. anyway. It's a lot of trucks. <laughs> and the city of Cascade Locks is within the Gorge National Scenic Area, but it's not actually part of the National Scenic Area. But air quality in a National Scenic Area is really a high priority issue. And so we know that that number of semis mm -hmm. would really have a significant impact on air quality. Well, I know the Boardman plant has been having an incredible uh, significant right. problems with air quality. In fact, it's even corro corroding some of the, the the Native American petroglyphs that have That's been right. up on the oh. gorge. So, you know, people have their eye on that w as well. And it, it's, it, it's, it seems to me that this would be a no-brainer. They've been stopped in uh, McLeod. They've been stopped in quite a few different places. Yeah. McLeod, California, down by Mount and Shasta. And consumers are stopping them, too. A lot of people are not buying bottled water anymore. So bottled water is really a dying industry. A lot of people have finally gotten the message bring your own water bottle, mm -hmm. don't buy bottled water. And a lot, especially in Portland, where we have incredibly high quality drinking water, mm -hmm. there's no reason to be going out and buying something in a plastic bottle. No, there sure isn't. Although I do see people walking out of the stores with cases of them. Yeah. Well, you know, we've got, a, I, I excerpted a couple of videos from a, a movie documentary called Flow. And if folks want to get to, I think it's Flow the movie or something to that effect, you know how to get onto Google. If we get someone to push a button in the control room there and we'll play this first couple minute clip that's a, that is a, uh, uh, a clip from there and then, then we'll come back. Most people don't think about where their water comes from. They just turn on the tap and they expect it to be there. Those days are ending. Humans are changing the climate. We already see evidence about it. One of the most significant impacts of climate change will be on our water resources. This notion that we'll have water forever is wrong. The world is running out of fresh water. In the last 10 years, major water companies from Europe have started taking advantage of pollution and scarcity. Who owns water? Who gets to make the decisions about water? Water privatization was forced on Bolivia by the World Bank. Water is the most precious commodity for them in the world. It's blue gold. Water is a common resource. Water is not a property. The water sector is going to grow two to three times the global economy over the next 20 years. The market is amoral. And it's going to lead you to selling to those who can buy it and not to those who need it. They're spending tens of millions of dollars to convince us that bottled water is better than tap water. There is less than one person regulating the entire bottled water industry. People buying this stuff had no idea where it was coming from. The company kept pumping during a, a season of drought. They took so much water, they're being sued in five states. They kept pumping even then. This battle, this David and Goliath battle. Water must be protected everywhere. Who owns the water for survival owns you. And that's the picture that people have to understand. It's not a Democratic issue and it's not a Republican issue. It's a people issue. Without water, we have no society, we have no economy, we have no life. People say that, well, water's a lot like air. You shouldn't charge for water. Well, okay, watch what happens. I was in town a while back, and unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to see it. Uh, I guess I'm going to have to figure out a way to do that, because that one clip uh, it wet my whistle, and they talked a lot. Of, there's so many different issues with this. One of the major issues with me is it, it just keeps us hooked up to petroleum, because the, things made, the bottles are made of plastic. And I understand they're actually going to make the bottles on site there. Is that what's going on? Do yeah, I remember that right? Now they're also talking about how they're using less plastic in each bottle and all these things. But the fact of the matter remains that it's still a petroleum product and mm -hmm. it's you know still clogging up our waterways. Um, 
you go to the most remote beaches and you're going to see plastic bottles everywhere, so it's still a big issue. Mm -hmm. I know there's a, these, these water filters are uh, showing now so many bottles are used, it'll go around the world two or three times and if you use a Brita or whatever, it'll cut back on so many of them. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not a commercial, by the way, but it just, it just shows to go you that, that all this is, uh, it's becoming common knowledge, as you, as you said, that they're starting to, they're starting to lose their, their market value. Yeah, and you know, in Portland and in much of the Northwest, we're blessed with such incredibly good water. Our water in Portland comes from Bull Run, and actually a third of all Oregonians drink water from Mount Hood National Forest. So we have great water. Our water is clean, um, it's safe, we don't have any problems with it. And so the water you get from the tap is the best water you can get here. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, it's a little bit deceptive to to pretend that you're going to get better water anywhere else. Right, and I think there's they, they got two different uh, commodities. They're going to have one that's spring water mm -hmm. and one that's not, I believe. Yeah, that's just regular right. municipal water. It's interesting because the water that's coming out of the side of the hill, I have footage of it, but I wasn't able to get it extracted in order in time for the show tonight. But it's coming out of the side of the hill, and that's basically the same water that's going down the other side of the hill in, into the Columbia, I mean, into the uh, Bull Run watershed. Yeah, it's excellent water, really high quality, nice water, and currently it provides a thermal refuge for endangered steelhead. The Columbia River gets so hot during the summer that those steelhead really rely on Herman Creek and the water that comes out of that spring that the hatchery doesn't use, they hold there um, in the summer months, they'll hold in that cold water and use it as a refuge from the hotter water around the river that they can't survive in. So it's really a, an important uh, water source. Mm -hmm. Well, in January of 2010, uh, Bark took a hike up there, and Julia DeGraw, she uh, led the hike, and you were also on, on hand with that. And we went through that Herman Creek fish hatchery. Of course, being a government employee, they weren't going to be really very forthcoming right. about what some of the negative issues would be. But people did ask the question if this water is taken, uh, is, is taken from the access of the fish hatchery, uh, is that going to affect the fish hatchery? And uh, he wasn't very forthcoming, but what, what, what is Bark's opinion on that? Well, you know, we only have one study that actually really analyzes the chemical composition of the water, and Nestle funded that study. Oh, um, funny so thing. That, <laughs> that study found that the water that they would replace, use to replace the spring water is the exact same chemically. Um, and about, we, we just don't have the resources to refute that study. How about temperature-wise? It's also fairly cold. Um, the first time they did, tried to do a study on it, uh, they killed all the fish because they used chlorinated water by accident, but they've promised not to do that again. <laughs> um, and they also did the study with rainbow trout, not with the same salmon species that they are raising there. Mm -hmm. um, so there's some, definitely some issues with the study. And so pretty much from what you were saying, we're still in the first stage of this. Are there other stages that are going to come to say, say whatever the the uh, well, the organization, the, the government agency says, it's okay to go ahead and do this trade. What is the next step? Well, there's three different applications, so they'd have to approve all three of those. And on all three of them, we have the ability to protest the applications, and then we have the ability to go to court if we need to. Um, we have We've submitted really extensive public comments, and the public has also submitted thousands of public comments, um, which has been a really great experience to see how much people care. People have responded to that. Oh, people really um, get very passionate about this issue, and with good reason. So we've submitted you know, extensive legal comments that explain why this application shouldn't happen. Um, one of the threshold criteria for one of the applications um, is what is whether this is in the public interest. And there's an assumption that the application would be in the public interest. And so we've come back and said we can rebut this presumption of public interest because of all the things that we've discussed, um, why mm. this is a bad idea, why this is bad for Cascade Locks, why this is bad for Oregonians. Why this, this sets a really bad precedent for our state. Well, why would it be a good idea other than the fact that a few people get some jobs and, and some stockholders uh, get a good return on their money? I mean, what, what, what is really good about it? Well, it's, I mean, it's more profits for a multinational corporation. You know, Nestle is a Swiss corporation, and they'll see more profits at headquarters if they can get their mm -hmm. hands on this water, they think, so far. Um, we'll see. 
I personally uh, have a feeling that we're going to win. Mm -hmm. I want to. I want to uh, kind of back up a little bit. Uh, we're interviewing Lorianne Bird, who is the campaign manager for the Restore Mount Hood campaign. Our graphics machine went out on us. You might have been seeing the screens pop up, different colors, and they're trying to get that to work. So we can't put up any graphics. But I want to make sure that folks realize that, uh, uh, write this down, it's an easy one, www.bark hyphen or dash however you want to say that bark hyphen out dot org is the website and the phone number is 503-331-0374 and I'll just be I'll just be the character generator through this program and I'll, I'll mention that a couple times and I want to mention it now because the uh, on on Bark's site bark dash out dot org the uh, th there's a little news wire with with different uh, articles, so to speak, on it, and the third one down has to do with with the uh, there's a, a minor campaign since there's no big hurry on this. Is this going to take months and months and months to to reach a final conclusion? Uh, there's a, a, a campaign now to to uh, for folks to email the governor about this because you could speak a little That's about right. that. That's um, right. We really strongly feel that now is the time to get in touch with the governor and let him know that we oppose this project. He's not taken a stance um, on Nestle so far. He's still relatively new, um, and we've been talking with his advisors. We're meeting with them again in two weeks. We're going to have a new economic impact study that's going to show why this is bad for our state. And so now is the time to reach out to the governor and say, hey, we've already put too many state resources into this, having ODFW work on these applications, having the Oregon Water Resource Department even looking at them. They've had to process thousands of comments for us. They know that this process is being closely scrutinized. It could end up in litigation. Who knows? What we do know is that we should not put any more state resources into this project. So we're asking the governor to either ask the Oregon Water Resource Department to deny the applications or to ask the Oregon um, Department of Fish and Wildlife to withdraw their applications and just stop this process now before it goes any further. And that has been, that has happened. Might have been different agencies, but I know down there, uh, just south of, of uh, Mount Shasta, at a place called McLeod, uh, they went round and round and round. And I think that turned a lot of local people into activists. And McLeod at one time was a company town, lumber company town. And uh, it's, it's gone through some changes. And do you know the story on how that was stopped? Or was it similar to, to the state agencies that? Uh, <laughs> I can't speak to that story in great detail. I'm sorry for that. Um, it's a very inspiring story, and if you watch Flo, they'll tell the story better than I can, for mm -hmm. sure. Um, but with all these things, it takes effort from every side. So when Bark takes on a destructive project, we attack it legally, we attack it through grassroots organizing, um, we use social media, we talk to our electeds, we talk to everyone we can, we table at all kinds of events. And we just really approach things from every angle. So you'll see stories in the newspaper. You'll see us really trying to bring awareness to the issue in every way possible. So we don't just take one tactic. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that that's also what happened in McLeod. You say social media. Is there a Facebook page for any of this? We do. You can like Bark on Facebook. Um, we're on Facebook, so please come right. find us. And then also our website, like Jim said, is www.bark-out.org. And the Nestle story is the third story down. Um, and if you click on that link, it's actually our September newsletter, which I hope you'll read. It's really good. And then you can take action on the Nestle issue there. It, it provides a page that you can go to to, to uh, automatically send an email to, right. the, to the governor. That's right. Now, speaking of the governor, did Kolongoski ever take a stand on this? He didn't seem to take a stand on much of anything, it seemed yeah, like. Yeah, no, we didn't. I mean, he didn't advise the state agencies to not move forward. So maybe that was tacit. Um, approval. approval. Yeah. Maybe not. Um, it definitely did proceed under his watch, but we just haven't heard anything from our current governor. Yeah, basically, if you don't if you don't stop it, that that is tacit approval because That's they're, right. they're going to keep going, and they're going to probably try to keep going even if if uh, they get a no, because they might be able to appeal it as well. Yeah. That's right. So that's how usually how it goes. So again, it's www.bark-out.org. And there's other interesting things along the left side there. Uh, there's different stories, one of which we're going to be talking about in a, in a little bit here. And uh, this has been going on for some time. I haven't really noticed a lot of 
uh, mainstream media. Has this been covered very much? It has. It's gotten a good amount of coverage so far, especially around the time that um, the applications were submitted. It's definitely gotten some attention, and like I mentioned, thousands of people have submitted co public comments, so that's gotten some attention mm -hmm. as well. And, and there's definitely been some uh, pretty active debate in the opinion pages of some local newspapers. Nestle has a representative um, stationed in Cascade Locks, and so they've kept busy um, writing rebuttals to our letters to the editor. Especially in their, lo their local paper out there, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah I haven't noticed a whole lot here. Uh, it just seems to me that uh, it would be a no-brainer, but then so often when things happen to do with the environment on one side and people being able to eke out a living on the other, it, it always it quite often comes down on the side of, of the jobs rather than the, the environment equation. And uh, since Bark is, is involved in forest ad advocacy, even though this isn't specifically a forest issue, uh, a lot of what, being on the board, I know that a lot of what Bark is looking forward to the future is, is water. That's right. And you know, I don't actually think that, a lot of times people like to frame things as environment versus jobs, and I don't think that's the case at all. I think there's lots of win-win solutions out there. So for example, in Cascade Locks, they're looking at putting a bike path along the river to draw people in, and when I was there leading um, a couple group hikes to check out the proposed spring, the, the spring that Nestle proposes to take the water from, we saw tons of people biking around Cascade Locks. There were huge lines for ice cream. People want to go there. It's a beautiful place. And so if you give them some really nice bike paths and you give them places to go, there's a lot to do. Um, the Herman Creek Trailhead and Campground provides access to this world-class trail network. You can really go deep into the gorge. And it's a great place to access if you want to go for a longer backpack trip. There's a lot of shorter hikes, too. Mm -hmm. um, we took a hike when we took that trip. We went up in a ways, right? two years ago and uh, you can go in all different directions up there it's a great destination and that should be getting promoted and that'll bring people into Cascade Locks and that'll create some great jobs for people there's no reason not to take mm -hmm. advantage of the natural resources that are already there and rather than exploiting them drawing people to them so they can enjoy them and then maybe building a little bit of a tourism industry off that I've seen statistics in the past I forget exactly what they were but it was a large amount of magnitude differences that money comes in from from recreation and tourism than it does from at that time it was logging yeah that's right and those those kinds of jobs will stick around because people aren't going to all of a sudden one year stop going to this trailhead network right now there's just not a lot for people to do when they visit cascade locks they kind of zoom in and zoom out cross the cross the bridge of the gods or maybe right. you know, the yeah. other side maybe buy some salmon or something but there's really not that much to draw people in and if you put in some more things and promoted that trail network that's great and that is a part of mount hood national forest um and promoted just how beautiful Herman Creek is in the whole surrounding area. It's just gorgeous. Um, there's a beautiful grove of a rare kind of oak up there. It's really a special place. And uh, I think that's the kind of thing that could create a sustainable economy that could go on and on rather than the city of Cascade Locks hedging their bets on yet another industry that's doomed to fail soon anyway. Mm -hmm. Especially if you're putting uh things in place where you're gearing people down like riding bicycles. You're That's gearing right. them down and slowing them down to really appreciate it. That's right. Yeah, and you know, we definitely have tried to raise concerns about how will this affect um, the tourism industry in Cascade Locks. People are not going to want to go there if they're sharing the small road forest lane with all these semi-trucks. There's a KOA right there. Lots of people go there to camp. Um, People aren't going to want to camp right next to a bottled water plant with tons of trucks going up and down the street every day. Mm -hmm. That's a huge deterrent, especially if it starts affecting the air quality. Um, those are real issues that I hope um, people in Cascade Locks will start looking at more closely. Oh, and we're going to sure try to, to, to make that available to them. Well, we have one other little two-minute clip. I almost forgot about it and let it get by us. This is a little bit more about Nestle's uh, record as far as uh, what they have been doing in the past. And uh, it's not pretty, but we should take a look at this before we move on to the uh, next issue. When Nestle came into Michigan, they said, we're a good corporate citizen. We're not going to hurt anything. We're responsible. During the trial, the company kept pumping during a, a season of drought. Any of the predicted reductions in flow and dead stream will have absolutely no effect on that ecosystem. The 
stream area in front of one of the client's homes was basically a mud flat. I cross-examined the plant manager. I said, look at these pictures. There's a mud flat here. Don't you think you ought to stop pumping? They kept pumping even then. Some of these small channels that flow into the lake from this, these springs along the North Shore almost stopped flowing. The reality was, no matter what they said, there was significant adverse impact, and they kept pumping. Water has always had a public aspect to it. This water has always been considered not owned by anybody. I mean, you know, today we think, well, isn't that profound? It's not profound at all. I mean, that, that's just common sense. The judge ruled, he simply said, look, a diversion of water for selling somewhere else that diminishes the flow or lake, the integrity of this flow of water is unlawful. It cannot be done. They do not have the property right to do it. And he told them to turn off the pumps. Let's do the best we can. That's barkout.org, bark-out.org, or 503-331-0374. That's 503-331-0374. Get to their website or give them a call and do what we can so, uh, so uh, Cascade Locks doesn't come up there at the end of that show when they were showing all the places that, that uh, Nestle is bottling water. As you see, they bottle it no matter what. Once they, once they get their foot in the door, they have the, uh, the right and the obligation to uh, provide profits for their stockholders. And uh, at that point, it's out of the hands of the people. It's in our hands now, even though it isn't our decision to make. Uh, what they're talking about giving that water away, they're giving away the water that belongs to the people, even though it's not national forest specifically. Well, it's still on state it's, lands. It's still on state lands, which is And people's. it really is the people's issue. I mean, it's very interesting. The coalition that we have that's working on this is a really broad coalition, and that's one of the really exciting things we have. So we have unions, we have a variety of NGOs, we have the Alliance for Democracy, we have the Sierra Club, of course, BARC, um, a number mm -hmm. of other organizations are involved. Well, I'm glad to hear people. unions are, because usually they're on the side of whatever gives them well, jobs. One union. Well, um, one union. And, and <laughs> but still, we have you know a really great broad coalition. The Alliance for Democracy is involved. Local residents are involved. There's a lot of people who, there are a lot of people who are really concerned about this issue, and it's nice to be working with such a broad coalition. Mm -hmm. We know that that is really important for our decision makers to see that there's a really broad group of people who are joining together on joining this issue. Joining together. And uh, as, as I said, uh, the, the time for public comment on this is passed. And the next issue we're going to talk about, the, the time for public comment is passed on this too. But it has to do with a mountain, a series of mountain trails up on Mount Hood, uh, up in the Alpine areas. Yeah, so it's um, a proposed lift-assisted mountain bike um, trail system, I guess for lack of better words, and a uh, skills park. So that would be a 0.2 acre skills park where that would have jumps and those kinds of things. And then the trail network would be 17 miles of downhill trails on Mount Hood. And I think it's really important that people understand this is different from what you think of when you talk about regular mountain biking. This is a system that is based on going up the hill, up Mount Hood at Timberline Lodge um, in a ski lift and then just bombing down over and over again until you get tired. So it's not, you know, traditional mountain biking, which Bark is very supportive of, where you actually 
you know, use human power to get up the hill and come back down. Um, this is a really high impact activity because people are bombing down the hill so fast. Um, mm -hmm. It's above the tree line and above the vegetation line, so yeah, it's at six thousand feet. So that that would be, you know, um, when you're out in the forest and you're on bikes. I mean, there's 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 uh, the dirt, obviously, but you know, there's roots and there's there's uh, things that kind of tend to hold the forest together. But up there, it's just gravel and rock. I would imagine it's really fragile alpine soil. Um, the stuff is really delicate, and any disturbance is. A pretty permanent disturbance. Of course, things will always repair themselves, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of our lifetimes, these are really major impacts. And so, you know, the way that the way that they've been framing it is that this is ju they're just considering the impacts along these very very narrow little bike trails. But the truth is, people are going to get off their bikes to have a drink of water, or they're going to fall off their bikes because they're going downhill really fast. And there's going to be impacts, of course, outside of the tracks. We all know that when we hike on a trail, we step off the trail for a moment sure. here and there all the time, and that is inevitable, and that's going to cause a lot of trampling beyond the major impacts of creating 17 miles of new trails in these really fragile soils. So what they're going to be doing is they're going to be people are going to be hopping on the, the tram or whatever it is, ski lift, and going up to a certain height, and then as fast as they can come down probably, because that's the whole thrill of it. Yep. It isn't like they're out just sightseeing, which they can be doing some of that as well, but they're going to be speed racing down this mountain, and uh, they cannot help but create conditions for erosion. That's right. This, I mean... They are bringing in specialists in trail building who have done this in other places, but Mount Hood soils are different from other places. They're really fragile. Um, and, you know, this is a very highly specialized sport. You're gonna, you can't just bring your old clunker up there to do this. You're going to have to rent the bikes there because you're going to need a very specific oh, type really? of bike. Oh, okay. You'll probably need to wear body armor. Um, you know, this isn't just, you know. Body go, armor. go biking around. So there'd be ninja bicyclists. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had, you know, uh, I had no idea a lot of this was going on. I knew they were wanting to put up bike trails up there, and I've actually discussed this with you before about coming on the show, and I didn't really have a grip on what this was all about. Uh, so, who is who is uh, proposing this? Well, so is it the is it the RLK is the or, um, is the business that manages Timberline Lodge. And they've been up there for a long time. And they manage Timberline Lodge and also, of course, the ski area. Um, and they work very closely. They're a permittee of the Forest Service. So they work very closely with the Forest Service. But for this project to move forward, because it's our federal land, it's our forest, the National Forest um, has to do comply with the National Environmental Policy Act. And so they have to do an environmental assessment. So they have to look at all the impacts this project has to wildlife, to birds, um, to fungus, to soils, to water, to everything. And so that's the process they're in. They've done their preliminary assessment, and now we're just waiting for their final environmental assessment. So the, as I mentioned at the beginning of this segment, the, the, um, the uh, public testimony p period is over. Will there be another one after this decision comes There's out? There's no additional public comment period. The next step is that the Forest Service will issue their environmental assessment and their decision notice whether or not they decide to proceed with this. We hope they'll just look at this and say, look, the impacts are too significant and not proceed with it. But if they decide that they will, then um, organizations that submitted comments during the comment period have the right to appeal the decision. And appealing the decision is the first step to litigation uh -huh. if we decide not to resolve the appeal. Uh, who do you appeal it to? The Forest Service itself? To the itself? Forest Service, that's right. And so, if that doesn't work, then you then you have the op the opportunity or the the chance that you can you can sue them over it. Then that's right. And we um, we've been working with other organizations on this issue, specifically the Friends of Mount Hood, and the Crag Law Center, and the Mazamas are really involved and engaged on this issue. And a number of other groups have also weighed in. This project has major impacts um, on a number of resources, so it would be really disturbing for the elk herd that are up there and elk. Once they are disturbed in an area, they're very unlikely to come back. And especially in the era of climate change, we have so little high elevation uh, habitat on Mount Hood because it's a relatively low elevation forest. And then 
you know, there's these very few alpine areas um, for animals like elk to go to in the summer when it gets really hot like, like, like it is right now. Like Elk Meadows, right. which I've been to. It's, it's beautiful. It's gorgeous up there. Yeah, Elk Cove is a gorgeous place. And I've been hearing people saying that they've been seeing elk up in the high alpine areas right now. And right now is exactly when the mountain bike park would be running at probably, you know, full capacity because they're, of course, not they're under snow most of the year, so they have about 90 days a year that they'll be able to run. So they're going to really try to bring people in there. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly the time that the elk want to be in that area. So it's really chasing animals out of the very little high elevation habitat they have. And as our world continues warming, those animals are going to need that high elevation habitat more and more. There's something I've noticed about the Forest Service all along in, in our hikes and all is that uh, they, they tend to have tunnel vision on things. They don't necessarily take into consideration the cumulative effects of things. Like you're saying, all they're talking about is necessarily the, the actual trails themselves. And, uh, you know, and it's true people step off the trails, but, but uh, there are other issues, like you're saying, with, with the, uh, the elk. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're going to be breaking up uh, other uh, trail systems from other animals as well. And, right. and, and these, these all will have repercussions. That's right. And another impact um, to wildlife is impacts to salmon. The lift that they would be using is the Jeff Fudd lift, and that is exactly at the headwaters of Still Creek. Still Creek rolls into the Sandy, which goes into the Columbia, and is really important um, for steelhead. And so there are major impacts to protected salmon, and these salmon have protection under the Endangered Species Act. They're federally protected fish, and they're such an important cultural resource for all of us, and of course critical for our entire ecosystem. And so this, this headwaters of Still Creek is already so impacted just by having a lift there, and then to have people tromping all around it all mm -hmm. summer long is really going to increase the sediment flow in there, and that's a major issue. Will this necessitate them adding anything to the lifts? Uh, probably not. Probably, you know, they'll just have to put something to, for people to rig their bikes on, too. Mm -hmm. um, but they have, that is a, the Jeff Flood lift is a relatively new lift, and they try to do mitigation on the environmental impacts, and everyone will tell you that their mitigation efforts have not been very successful. So it still looks pretty gnarly up there, so it's kind of shocking that they want to add to the impacts before they've even gotten a grip on the impacts that they were already supposed to mitigate. So, so there are some real issues up there. So when you say they, you don't mean the Forest Service, you mean the, the, the uh, business concern that's, that's up there. They're the ones that are supposed to be mitigating Well, this. they're and supposed they to be working it. together on these kinds of things. So, so the Forest Service is actually supposed to be there over their shoulder then. Right. Yeah. I mean, it is our federal public land. Mm -hmm. Well, you did mention a little while ago that this, is, this has been parallels in other areas. And, uh, and and Mount Hood has it's got its own set of of uh, circumstances that are that are unique. Uh, have they put these in anywhere else? Yes. In fact, there's actually a lift-assisted mountain bike park at Snowball. Um, it's just not really used. People say it's not very good. And there's also one at Whistler. And they always give Whistler as the example. Look how successful this park has Where's been at Whistler. Whistler. Whistler is in British Columbia. Oh, okay. Right, right. It's a yeah. very, very different mountain. Their soils are completely different, and that area already sees an enormous amount of tourism in the summer. So it's a very, it's not a great analogy. Mount Hood is special. You know, there are a lot of very unique things there. And the analogy I always like to give is that I like donuts, and I like Pikes Peak. I used to live in Colorado Springs, and we had a donut shop on top of Pikes Peak. <laughs> I found that to be pretty offensive to look up at this beautiful mountain where America the Beautiful was written and see the blinking light of a donut shop all the time. And I think that's a pretty similar situation here where mountain biking is great and Mount Hood is great and Timberline is great, but that doesn't mean we have to have mountain biking at Timberline. There's many better places to put mountain bike trails in Mount Hood. Lower down. Absolutely. And that's something we've definitely been advocating for. And we have mountain bike groups as part of our Restore Mount Hood Coalition. I don't want to give the impression that we're in any way opposed to mountain biking. Mountain biking is totally a legitimate quiet recreation activity in our forests. And we definitely are not discouraging that. We're just discouraging um, we're discouraging activities that have way too significant impacts on our national forests. So I just want to get that message out that recreation is one of the most important uses of our national forests, but it should never be at the expense of elk and salmon. There are better places to put this. 
So one thing we've been looking at is road to trail conversions. There are thousands of miles of roads in Mount Hood. Many of them are not in decent shape. They're crumbling. The sediment is having really Im significant impacts on our streams, again, hurting salmon. So the Forest Service is actually doing a great job of addressing those issues in Mount Hood, and they're decommissioning a lot of roads um, that are just crumbling old um, logging roads that no one uses. So these aren't the roads that go to our trailheads or the places that we love to recreate. These are just little spurs that go to old timber stands. And they're um, decommissioning a lot of these roads. And so we're saying, hey, let's take this as an opportunity to look and see if some of these old roads would be good trails for mountain bikes. And the Forest Service is taking a look at that right now as we speak. Mm -hmm. At various elevations, just below the Alpine. Yeah. Yeah, just in places that maybe are not quite as sensitive as the high elevations of Mount Hood. Mm -hmm. Well, I know when I when I have free time, I go to the I don't go to the, the uh, I don't go to the ocean. It's not my thing. I go to the high mountains, and uh, that the reason I do is because it, it it is a completely different world up there than it is lower elevation with a, with the the uh, the flora and the fauna, mainly the, the the wildflowers. The soil is very thin. It's just in actually in the very early stages of becoming soil, mm -hmm. and you know the the water is moving fast because it's really steep up there, and uh, and it just seems to me that this as with the the. Uh, the uh, earlier conversation we had about Nestle, it just seems a no-brainer that uh, this is just just too drastic of a, of a uh, imposition upon the mountain. Yeah, and you know, there's cultural impacts as well, and that's something that the Friends of Mount Hood have really um, been looking at, is Timberline Lodge is a gem. Um, it's, an, it's a historic lodge. People love to go there, and people go there in summer for peace and quiet. It's lovely to hike around. You can walk the Timberline Trail all around there, and it's really a nice, quiet place. And so this would also really change the character of that. So people like you and me who go up there for a nice experience and to go to this different world that's dominated by wildflowers where you can actually hear birds sing and this kind of thing aren't going to have that experience once the lift-assisted mountain bike park is in the area. They're going to be dealing with a lot of people being up there. And uh, what's to keep these folks on the trails? Well, one thing is they're saying that the trail design is going to be so good that it'll be much more fun to stay on the trail. So we'll see if that's the case. And, you know, I have a lot of faith in trail design. I think there's a lot of innovation there. So maybe, pe I mean, maybe people will stay on the trails. I'm not sure. Um, I can't guarantee that they'll, <laughs> they'll mm -hmm. uh, refrain from going off trail, though. That's sure. for sure. And... I think we should at least assume that maybe sometimes they'll get off their bikes and drink water, um, mm -hmm. and they're not going to do that in the middle of the trail where they'll get run over. Get run over. So those are some really significant issues. Mm -hmm. This would be a good time to to mention the fact that uh, Bark does a monthly hike, uh, like as you as we I mentioned we did one in January, well. 2010, and we might have even been back since then, I can't remember, to the Nestle area. But the the hike for this month, which is this coming Sunday, what, the 14th, 12th, 12th is it? Today's the 9th, the 9th so 10th, the 11th. 11th. Yeah, that's right. It's on it's on 9-11. Uh, so if you're already tired of all this 9-11 stuff, you just see it on TV. That's all we're hearing about lately. Uh, you can uh, go up to the Bark, for, the Bark hike, and again, it's 503-331- uh, 0374. Oh, but Jim, we won't be in the office over the well, weekend. No, well, that's so true. You won't be in the office over the weekend. If you weekend. want to call, if you so want information about go the, the hike, go to the website. Go to the website, which is what's coming up next. Uh, www.bark-out.org. That's www.bark-out.org. This is all in lieu of the fact that we don't have a, a graphics machine that can that can put this stuff up as we talk, so we have to make a special point to talk about this. And uh, information about this hike will, will be given there. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's the typical things. You've got to come prepared for weather. This time it's going to be for heat. And mm -hmm. it's still going to be pretty warm up there. I yeah, imagine. and the, the hike this month, which is in two days, is going to go walk some of the trails that they would um, 
be putting mountain bikes on. So it's a great opportunity to take a look for yourself at what these soils look like and what mm -hmm. it feels like up there this time of year and to experience the quiet and the wildflowers. The wildflowers are incredible right now. The lupin, the lupin and, 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 and everything Indian is paintbrush probably. just really incredible. It's mm -hmm. a special time of year to go up there. It's really an uh, extraordinarily beautiful spot. Um, and so are they going to be, uh, are they going to be uh, taking over some of the existing trails as well as putting in new trails? Well, they, it's interesting because they say that this area is already impacted because it's already a ski run. Um, but that's not actually the case because it's the impacts of people riding down, you know, five feet of snow <laughs> when there's five feet, of, you know, cushioning the ground from the snow and people actually being on the bare dirt are just completely different. It's really apples and oranges, so I wouldn't call it an already impacted area in that way. I mean, of course, it's not like the other side of Mount Hood, which is a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. less visited, but it's definitely, you know, a beautiful spot. And have you been up there and already traced out the hike that, that's going to be... I'm not leading the hike. One of our right. great it's, volunteers it's is leading right. the hike, um, and she knows a ton about the issue, and she's been up there... Um, and one of our staff people, Grady, will also be on the hike to answer your questions and point out flowers. He knows a lot of plants as well. So it's going to be a great hike. Um, and you can get information about that on our website, and they'll tell you where our meetup point is and what time and everything like right. that. So but we, definitely bring lots of water if you come. It'll be hot. Of, yeah, that, that's going to be an issue because even though it's probably not going to get much over 80 degrees, it's still going to seem a lot warmer up there and, and with all that reflected light and heat. Because yep. there's just nothing but rock up there. Yep. And there's probably even some snow as well in places. Yeah, you might find some patches. So just, just to let folks know, the, the, the meeting is at the uh, Trader Joe's there by the, uh, I don't know what they call it, the Hollywood, tra the Hollywood oh, okay. Transit Station there at uh, 39th and, uh, and uh, Halsey. Uh, there's a Trader Joe's right there, and that's where folks meet. Be there by nine o'clock, and uh, make sure you don't just come in sandals. <laughs> it's, I mean, the the, uh, the hiking is going to be on a lot of uh, probably jagged rock, and and uh, and there's not going to be any vegetation probably, at least not much, to uh, make it a little easier on your on your feet. So uh, I wouldn't be going up there with just even with just tennis shoes. Right. Yeah. Definitely wear some sturdy footwear, and you know. This is a special hike. Oftentimes our barkabouts, as you know, Jim, are to uh, some areas that aren't quite so pretty. We oftentimes go to areas that have been logged, or we're looking at old roads, or we're looking at kind of messy, choppy forest, um, and you're walking through sort of dense things and not really getting a uh, scenic tour, but this one is actually going up to the high alpine area, so it'll be sort of unusually beautiful for mm -hmm. a barkabout. Not that our hikes aren't always great, but this one is unusually scenic. Um, and, of course, we're going to be talking about this project that could really impact that scenic nature. Right, and some of the scenic might be cut back on because of the smoke, but uh, we'll see. It didn't seem like it was as smoky today, but I think that the uh, newscaster was saying that the weather is going to shift and we're going to be getting more of an easterly flow. So I don't know how that's going to affect what's going on up there. But uh, the Timberline Lodge is, what, 6,000 feet, 6,500 feet, something like that. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be starting up fairly high. Yep. and. Uh, how high up, how far up do you, do you think the, the chairlift is going to be bringing folks? How much I don't know, that's how much a good question. A I know the majority of the trails are at around 6,000 feet. So definitely high elevation for Mount Hood. Mm -hmm. And like we have also mentioned here uh, probably once or twice, that there's no, there's no uh, as with Nestle, there's no public comment. And is there, there's no public comment in the future for this as well? Well, we've then. had two public comment well, we periods already. already. So we had the scoping period, and then we had a public comment on the period on the preliminary assessment. And actually, the Forest Service held an open house on this as well. So we've had some opportunities to give some input. Um, and again, I don't want to make it seem like we're not supportive of mountain biking. And we've been very specific about that in our comments and saying, hey, there's great opportunities to explore places to mountain bike but just not here. And one thing that the Forest Service has said is that there's this urgent need to put in these trails because there are new, there are new user-created trails being created all the time. And oftentimes when user-created trails are put in, they're not, because they're not done by professionals and they don't go through any kind of environmental review process, oftentimes there's some significant environmental impacts. And so maybe they cross a stream Just what I was gonna say, or riparian, something like that. Yeah. Or, yeah, they go through a meadow or have some sorts of really lasting impacts. And so I understand the concern to cut down on the number of user-created trails, but this isn't the kind of experience that people who are creating those user-created 
trails are looking for, those people are looking to ride through the forest. They're not just looking to bomb down the hill. And there are, you know, quite a few trails in Mount Hood. Of course, there could be more. All, all recreationists will always tell you that they want more. And I'm an avid recreationist myself. I do a lot of hiking, and I'm a cross-country skier. Of course, you know. Can always use more. Of course, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's always great new places that you want to explore, and we understand that. But we don't. There's no evidence to show that putting in this facility would cause people to stop riding in other places that might be illegal for them to ride in because this is going to cost quite a bit of money, of course. It's not going to be free to use the system. Well, if you got to rent a bike and then buy a ticket to go up. And right, you're going to have to buy a lift ticket. you got to drive. And yeah. You're talking to, you know, at least a $50 outing or something. Yeah, I actually, I'm not sure what they're going to charge for it, but, you know, people are still going to seek out free riding opportunities, and mm -hmm. so we should be working on creating those. <coughs> All right. Well, uh, we've talked about this for a while. If uh, We've got about eight minutes left. If folks uh, have any questions or comments, they can give us a call here. The numbers, oh, you can't put the numbers up. Oh, we're kind of crippled here tonight. But the number is 503-288-4442 or 288-4448. So just 288-4442 and 288-4448. And I'll, I'll mention those again in a couple of minutes. It makes it a little more clumsy to get phone calls. You just can't read it off the screen and dial a number from the screen. And uh, just remember that the, the BARC website is www.bark-out.org. And as Lorianne says, of course, no one's going to be their man in, the, man in the phones over the weekend. But that's www.bark-out.org. And we'll continue the conversation. Hopefully some were able to write that down. Uh, I did have a, a direction I wanted to go with that, and I totally forgot what it was. But there's a, a lot to talk about with this. If, they, if, if uh, they, I guess in this case means the Forest Service, says that this is an okay to go to do this, uh, you will appeal and you will appeal to the Forest Service itself. I'm not going to promise what we're going to do. We'll see well, what, I mean, that, we'll that see what happens is, that when we get open. the decision. That but option. there's definitely the option that we or any an, anyone else who submitted comments during the public comment period can appeal. And I know a number of people are really upset about this project. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't be surprised to see appeals on right. it. And of course, if you don't resolve an appeal, so if you don't get what you want in the appeal resolution process, or if the Forest Service doesn't... On either side, right. right um, so that then does, you can move forward. That with does litigation. remind me of what I wanted to talk, I wanted to go. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of organizations that are against this, and there are organizations for it. Yep. So what are some of the organizations that think this is okay? Is the BTA one of them? The Bicycle Alliance? You know, they did have a posting on their website encouraging people to come out to the open house and support this, and they were saying, "Great, more riding in the forest," and. I like to think that it's just a situation where there's more need for education because I know BTA is such a great advocate for bike commuting and all these really important things that are great for the environment. Mm -hmm. And this is really different from bike commuting. This is, and this isn't just taking a ride on your bike through the woods. This is a really high impact activity. Mm -hmm. And so I was sorry to see um, them promoting the open house and asking people to come out and support on their website for Did sure. they encourage people to get more information or just encourage them to come out? I don't remember. Yeah. Um, I'm sure they linked to some of the documents. You know, there is a lot of excitement among some people that this will be fun. But like I said, eating donuts is also fun. It doesn't mean that you want a donut shop on the top on of your top mountain. Of peak. You know, not every we don't want Mount Hood to be Disneyland and there are always going to be people who are going to want to develop more and more on Mount Hood. And this is just another in a series of many projects that um, have really been threats to Mount Hood. Mm hmm Well the phone number again is five oh three two eight eight four 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 two and 503-288-4448. Now we've got a little under five minutes if folks have any questions, and we've covered this, these subjects pretty well here, and uh, there's always more to talk about. Uh, as with the Nestle, uh, they're both beyond the point of any, any, any public, unfortunately there's no public intervention or public, public uh, testimony involved in this, but as with the, now that's a, that's a good point. Now the Nestle's gonna be it's still in the first stage of, of three, but uh, the uh, this park up there for bikes, it's probably further along in the, in the process. It is, yeah. Yeah, they really uh, rushed it along. So um, originally they were actually going to try not to even 
do an environmental assessment on it and we um, really encouraged the Forest Service to take a different path and look more closely at the environmental impacts, um, which I mentioned, erosion, scaring away elk, harming salmon habitat. There's some really significant impacts, so we're glad to see that they're actually taking the time to look at those impacts. Um, mm -hmm. With Nestle, we're still so, you know, we're in a point where we just want the governor to say, hey, let's kill this thing. So if you go to our website, and the third story down um, is the link to the Nestle issue, and you can take action and send an email to the governor's office saying, let's not put any more state resources into this. This, mm -hmm. this needs to stop. We need to put our state resources into green jobs and into the kind of development that's good for all Oregonians. This would be a really bad precedent. Speaking of Nestle or speaking of the, of the mountain, both of them would be a bad precedent. That's right. Yeah. And, you know, it's something that didn't occur to me before. You're, you're having to rent bikes up there, you're, and then you're having to take a tram up there. That's going to change the whole dynamic of, of what's going on up at the mountain. Yeah, I mean, it isn't. You know. It isn't just like there are going to be some trails that people can ride on. Right. It's it, the, whole, the whole face of what's going on up there is going to alter, it seems like. Yeah, and, you know, in a way it's a slippery slope once you just start putting more stuff up there, like, it would also be fun for some people to have a Ferris wheel up there and we want a Ferris <laughs> donut wheel shop. on that or a donut <laughs> shop or whatever. You know, I think we need to, this is Portland's backyard. This is the People's Mountain. It's the second most climbed mountain in the world. This place is sacred to a lot world. of people. I didn't know it was the world. Yep. And I know the Mount Hood National Forest is, is one of the, if not the most visited, one of the most visited in the country. Four million recreational visits a year. So it's really important to many of us. And we go there for peace and quiet and for solitude and to look at wildflowers. Um, and this would really change the character of things. So, you know, this is just another attempt at... Um, developing up there mm -hmm. and it would be there would uh, it would probably be a fair amount of money in this i would think if, if they're having to to get the lift tickets and they're having to rent the bikes and then uh, that many more people are going to be buying food and so they're looking at a significant boost in their uh in their profits up there yeah and so that's that you know it's the old you know we talked about jobs versus environment this is the old the old uh profit versus people yeah you know which we hear a lot about we're down to about a minute and a half. Uh, I was afraid we wouldn't get any calls because it's not as easy to remember the number and dial it. Uh, but uh, we, we covered this pretty well. Both of these issues are something that, that Bark has been working on. And you're working on a lot of other issues as well, you know, ro right. de uh, road decommissioning and a lot of other things. And if folks go to www.bark-out.org, you can read about a lot of what Bark is doing. There's a lot of PDF files, there's a lot of good information and uh, regarding these two issues that we just talked about, but other issues as well. So we've got about a minute left. Any, any follow-up you well, might want? Well, if you're interested in learning more about the issue and you want to read our public comments and some of the media that's been around both of these stories, um, to get to the Nestle story, it's just on the main page, and you'll just see a Nestle article up there. Not the one where you take action, but just an article on the it's right on the side right of the side. page. Um, and it's a little bit trickier to get to the Timberline story. To get to that one, you need to go to the In the Forest link. Across the top there. Across the top, there's a link that says In the Forest, and that lets you enter a timber sale database, which actually is an incredible resource if you're curious about any timber sale or all the timber sales in Mount Hood. We have all the past timber sales from the, um, the past 11 years in there and most of the projects. So if you go in there and you go under Restoration and Recreation, you can get to the Timberline page, um, and up there you can get all the comments, all the Forest Services documents, the preliminary assessment of the environmental impacts of this. The whole um, shebang. The whole uh, shebang. All right, we're down to about 15 seconds. I want to thank the crew for uh, doing their best to get the graphics working. And uh, they got a little bit of it going there. That's the, that's the problems we've been having all night. So anyway, you get to see what we're talking about. Uh, we'll be back next week. Thanks for tuning in.